All right, good evening. Uh, my name is James Vitrano, and I'll uh, help moderate the discussion this evening. I'm a resident of the city of Rochester. Uh, since this is an election within the municipal boundaries of the city of Rochester Hills, um, it's my honor to help out with this moderation. Um, the League of Women Voters is hosting this this evening, and they're a nonpartisan political nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participations of citizens and governments. Uh, they work to increase the understanding of major uh, public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. And we thank them very much this evening for, for organizing the entire event. Uh, tonight, we're going to introduce three candidates. Two are with us this evening. After they have an opening statement, I'll read a brief statement from the third candidate who unfortunately couldn't join us this evening. Um, the members of the Board of Trustees for the Rochester Hills Public Library serve the community without monetary compensation. Um, incorporated in 1924, the library is actually an independent um, municipal corporation and it's not under the control or jurisdiction of any of the municipalities it serves, it's an independent body. The elected governing board is nonpartisan, and once a member is elected, they cannot be removed from office except by order of the governor of the state of Michigan. It's our intention that the following, um, it's our intention that following this forum you will receive enough information and be able to cast a responsible vote. Candidates have drawn for the order of speaking and will introduce themselves with a one minute opening statement. Following the opening statement, the candidates will respond to questions from residents in our audience or re questions that I have received. Questions can be directed to any or all of the candidates, and each candidate will have approximately one, I'm sorry, approximately two minutes to uh, provide an answer. We won't be providing a hard cutoff, but we just ask that the candidates respect that, and if it does go long, I'll, I'll be able to step in. Um, if there is a response to a response, we will also welcome that. The goal here is to inform the residents in the best way that we can about your, uh, your answers to the questions. Um, questions and responses can only address issues that are per pertaining to the library board. So for the audience, if there are the questions that you have, um, there was an opportunity to be involved in a discussion last evening, and I'll announce another one next week for city issues. Please keep your, answer your questions specific to the library board. And at, please do not applaud during the, um, during the actual discussion. You can hold those till the end um, in respect to both time and for the candidates. All right, now we will begin opening statements. Um, Steve Reyna, I believe you will start us uh, with an opening statement, and Robert will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Steve Reyna, and I'm running for Rochester Hills Library Board to promote a three-prong agenda. One, I support fiscal responsibility, which is to say I want the library to support itself using the existing millage funding it's had for almost a century. Just like our communities and homeowners need to live within their means, our community library should do the same. Secondly, I'm strongly in favor of enhancing what I would refer to as community partnerships. Because the Rochester Hills area is such an attractive place to do business, each month our local chamber of commerce welcomes a handful of new businesses to the area. It's my belief that enhancing our relationship with our local business community, among others, uh, in doing that, we can give these business and other concerns a way to use library sponsorships to help grow their reputation footprint. Finally, I'm in support of personal pol personnel policies at the library to help secure points one and two of my agenda. Many community libraries, for example, have an annual review of their library director to help ensure the library stays on track with its mission. These reviews are not intended to put the director under the gun, so to speak, but rather to help service that important goal of making sure everyone is on the same page in terms of the library's fidelity to its mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert uh, Bonham, you're next. Hi, I'm Robert Bonham. I have uh, married, I have three sons, three grandchildren. I've uh, lived in the Rochester Hills for 47 years. I've been on the library board for 35, 35 years um, and seen the board through new buildings, new directors, new additions, new uh, additions to the building that are not necessarily built. For example, the uh, two bookmobiles. And I've uh, been every position on the board several times. Um, I'm currently the president of the board. I have uh, been voted 
uh, Library Trustee of the Year by the American Library Association. Um, I've, uh, I've worked hard to accomplish these things in most cost-effective way, including balanced budgets every year that I've been here. Uh, and we have uh, some of the things that have been mentioned. We do a director's report uh, evaluation regularly. Um, it's important to me to see that the work to meet the community's changes and needs from books, audiovisual materials, to computers and ebooks, makerspace, and other resources and programs for all ages. Um, and the blue book, the blue bookmobile, is a perfect example of that. That is for the young, the pre kindergarten, the kindergartners. We try to get them interested in library stuff right from the beginning. Uh, I'm proud to have been. Uh, this library was voted one of the best libraries in the country uh, during my term. Uh, I'm very proud of that. And the library is very important to me and my family and to our community. I believe I'm the best candidate because of my accounting background, my years of the Board of the Reputation, and my knowledge of the library's functioning, the way it's taken care of and done here. Uh, I want to maintain the high standard, and we'll, we'll all come to expect from the Rochester Hills Public Library. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then I'll read a statement from our third candidate. Um, and this statement is from current library trustee Ann Kutcher. Due to illness, I'm very sorry I am, um, I am unable to be with you tonight. I'm a retired educator with degrees from Oakland University and Wayne State University. I have been a homeowner for 46 years in Rochester Hills and lived in the Rochester area for 51 years. I am, an act I am active in various community organizations an avid library user, and have been a library trustee for 10 years. I have a strong commitment to the library and its vital place in our community. I will work hard to ensure the library's programs and services, materials, and partnerships in the community remain current and continue to grow in the years to come. The library is an educational resource, and as a, commun and as a community meeting place, it's invaluable. The Rochester area is a wonderful place to live, due in large part to the Rochester Hills Public Library. That concludes our opening statements from the candidates. Um, now we will take the uh, first question from the audience, if there is one. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, the Friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library is the largest uh, volunteer group uh, raising tens of thousands of dollars each year for the support of the library. My question is twofold. Are either of you a member of the Friends of the Library? Mr. Bonham? I am a friend, member of the Friends, and I participate in uh, book donations, uh, the library store. Um, my wife goes to the, uh, the Christmas walk. Um, and I've gone to some of the other events, one of which is coming up. Shouldn't be a plug for the Friends, but there's one coming up, too, uh, at uh, Royal Park, and I have participated in those. That's, that actually is my second part of the question. Uh, <laughs> our, uh, Mr. Ryan, are you a member of the Friends of the Library, and if, if you are, how do you support their efforts to benefit the library? I've specifically made the decision from when I, when I first formed an interest in becoming an uh, elected member of the library board, I've specifically made the decision not to become a member of the Friends organization or any other specific group. It's my belief that the necessary impartiality that a board member would need to have in order to service their representation of homeowners and homeowner interests is ably served by having somebody on there who uh, is free of membership in an or, uh, some, some specialty organization. Thank you. Um, this question is mainly for uh, Mr. Bonham because you've sort of answered it, Mr. Reyna, but if you want to add to it after his response, I would like to hear that. Were you in support or not in support of the millage that was in question? And why whatever position you took? Well, if, uh, if you'd looked at the minutes that are available for the library board, you will see that the discussion on the millage was quite long, uh, several months. I, I don't mean like three or four, I mean like seven months. It was discussed, brought up, and decided what to do. And then it turned out that the, uh, a number of other organizations were going to go out for a millage at the same time. So we decided not to overload it with a lot of millage 
proposals all at one time, that it would be better if we waited for a different time. And I was in support of it. If I may add to that, uh, as is no secret, um, I've been an opponent of a millage increase for the library board, and that was the reason for my entry into the race. I believe some very important facts need to be made out as far as the history of the millage. For the better part of a decade, members of the library board have been interested in moving the millage from its existing rate to a higher rate. So that's been under discussion for the better part of a decade. In spring of 2019, the library board announced that it was finally going to make it an issue and they were going to put it on the fall ballot for 2019. One month after the library newsletter came out where this announcement was made, I announced my candidacy for library board and made it a cornerstone of my candidacy that I was opposing that millage. And then after I had obtained several endorsements, including the endorsement of Oakland County Treasurer uh, Andy Meisner, on June 12th, the library board voted to rescind the position that it had taken essentially two months before that they wanted a millage increase. So for that reason, it's been my repeated contention that it's my entry into this race that that prompted a reconsideration of the millage request because the library board was concerned about having two incumbent candidates going into a fall election where they were gonna have to face off against an anti-millage candidate. And while I'm on this, I, I think one other point needs to be made. After the library board made its decision on June 12 to table, not, not terminate the millage increase request, what they said was, well, we're tabling it, but we could bring it up as early as spring of 2020. Well, in spring of 2020, there aren't going to be any library board candidates. At a bare minimum, the library board should take the position that it's not going to do a millage increase in a, in a, on an election day when at least two members of the board aren't up for election so that voters have a meaningful opportunity not only to vote on the millage, but to vote on their position and to have the candidates come out one way or the other in terms of where they stand and why. Thank you. Another question? Uh, is your question for both candidates? Um, it can be, yes. Um, the question is for both candidates. Uh, maybe, uh, Mr. Reyna, if you can start this one, and then we'll go to Mr. Bond. I'm wearing, my name is Anna Neal, and I wear two hats. I'm a resident of Rochester Hills for 20 years. I'm also an employee at the library for the last 14. And may I say, I've been a volunteer at the library for 20 years as well. Um, the question is, going forward, we are looking, the library is going to be hiring a new director. The question is twofold. What is your vision for the future of the library, and how would you give this guidance, advice, or direction to the new director? Well, first off, I'd want to thank you very much for your volunteer work at the library, and I'd like to thank everybody else who does work as a volunteer at the library. One of the blessings our library has are the many people, the legions of people who come out through their hard work and efforts to just support it through their actual hard labors. It's a very positive thing, and I'm very appreciative of that. The next thing I'd say is, in terms of the selection of a new director, I would be very consistent with what I said in my three-prong agenda in my opening statement. I think that we can, just like when you're maintaining a household, you can have a quality automobile, a quality household, a quality standard of living, and you can make sure all the things are balanced. I think the same thing takes place in terms of the running of a library. I couldn't be a bigger fan of the library than I am, but at the same time, I recognize that our homeowners have other obligations they have to meet other than the millage obligation they have to the library, and because of that, we need to be respectful about making sure we provide a quality service at the historically same rate that was in effect when uh, Calvin Coolidge was president. So I'm interested in reaching into all the niches that we can reach into in terms of opportunities that are opening up in the 21st century through the internet and otherwise. I was very excited when uh, the multimedia room was, was added upstairs where you can actually do 3D modeling. I think that's an excellent addition to the library. I think all these cost-conscious things that we can do to stay in budget, be responsible to our homeowners, be responsible to their pocketbooks, and yet provide a quality service. Boy, those are all things that I, I'd be excited to see, you know, the, the library director and the, and the staff that support her be on board with. 
The library has been run on a millage that was passed in uh, 1924. Um, some of you, are, most of you are not old enough to remember that, but even if you go back to the 50s and 60s, you will find that your expenses have gone up, gone up considerably. Uh, and in fact, what we got from the millage has gone down due to the Headley. The Headley millage has decreased our millage 40%. So we have the ability to go for a dollar, but when that dollar comes to us, it's only 60 cents. Now, we have run this library on a balanced budget and continue to go on. We've had some growth in the city and that has helped tremendously, but that's not going to continue forever. So for us to continue to pull out the types of programs and stuff that our community is asking for and they would like to do more of, we need to do something to correct that. Now in 2008, uh, as he mentioned about 10 years ago, we got the recession, and that dropped values and dropped the income that the library was receiving by quite a bit. Now, 10 years later, we're almost back to the budget that we had 10 years ago. That situation isn't unique to the library. That situation is everybody that's a resident of the state of Michigan, homeowners, businesses, and everyone has had that same situation. We would like to continue to improve the library. One of the things we have done is fiscally, we've had a balanced budget every year, yet we have still done some major improvements. So, you know, we are fiscally responsibility. We've added, we, even when we added the addition on, we had saved the money up to do that. We had saved the money up and got help from the friends to buy the bookmobiles. You know, the, the friends have been very, very helpful to us. And these are the things that are gonna need to go on in the future. I'm not afraid to say we might have to raise the, the uh, millage because we don't get the monies we used to get. And that's the, the way it's been for the last eight years and it's gonna continue for, uh, continue for time forward. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I happen to be a retired librarian spent 40 years in the field. I've worked at university libraries, public libraries, community college libraries. I've worked in all aspects, um, ended up being very computer involved. So needless to say, in 40 years, I've seen a lot of change. And libraries as an institution cannot remain stagnant or the whole rationale goes away. So not considering um, the millage possibility. I'd like to know what kind of changes you envision in library service, say in the next five years, or if you really want to go ahead, in the next 10 years. And maybe Mr. Bottom, you can take this one first. Well, we try to keep a pulse on the uh, patrons of the library, and a lot of the changes that we've made are because the patrons have suggested we need this, we need that. So we have done keeping a pace on those. We, uh, I myself keep up with uh, American Library Association and I go to every board meeting, I go to every committee meeting, I wander through the library myself. Some of the employees that happen to be in here know that they have seen me in talking to the employees. And when I'm talking to the employees, I wanna know, well, what are the patrons saying to you? What are they asking for? This is the type of stuff that dictates to us what we need. So we've been very diligent about keeping an eye on what the patrons are asking for and through the associations, keeping an eye on what other libraries are doing and what we can do to future gains in the library's communications. The great philosopher Wittgenstein once said, of what one does not know, one must concede ignorance. And I think that as we proceed into the 21st century and we proceed into this technological era, there's enough of a, a change, a sea change going on that we have to be ready to, uh, as, as Mr. Bottom said, keep our finger at the pulse and see what's been going on. Now it is significant to me that the bookmobiles, the two bookmobiles that are operated by the library, constitute the number one bookmobile circulation for bookmobiles in the state of Michigan. 
So that's an, that's an important example of how by staying within an existing millage, the library can respond to people on the ground, to desires on the ground, to, uh, to needs on the ground, to, to patron interest, and make sure that the outreach is being made in an important way. Now, Mr. Bonham also referenced something about the idea of saving up money and putting it aside. Because of my Wittgenstein quote, I think the very best service we could do to our library patrons is to make sure that we have as large as possible of a rainy day fund in existence at our library as possible. As if the more money we have, the easier it is for us to transition into new needs, the better off we're going to be in terms of servicing these interests as they become up and as they, as they come up and, be, and, and are made known. Now, I'm going to respectfully disagree with the president in terms of the wisdom of the million dollars that was spent four years ago. Four years ago, this library had an over $1 million, I think it was $1.2 million, rainy day fund. That million dollar fund was used for some nice refurbishments, but still they were refurbishments. It's a bit like me going and putting a new frontage on my house or a new pool in the backyard and then saying, well, hey, I need money for this thing or I need money for that thing. With all due respect, I think one of the most important missions we can deliver to, to, to library patrons, to our homeowners, is to make sure that the financial rainy day resources we're going to have, the financial viability that we're going to have, is going to put us in a situation where we're flexible and we have the resources that we need to, so that if, hey, there's going to be a $30,000 job that needs to, to, to go on to fix uh, you know, holes in a parking lot, or, hey, if there's going to be $16,000 to uh, put new brakes on a bookmobile, you know, we're not going to be having to count pennies. Again, because of the Wittgenstein quote, it's important for us to recognize that a lot of these answers are going to be coming as the course of technology develops and helps introduce us to where appropriate investment should be made, while at the same time having the monies necessary to fund that investment without having to say to the voters, hey, we need, uh, we need more money. Now, at some point... Thank I, you, Mr. Rayner. Okay, we'll thank you. probably circle back and you'll have another opportunity. Did you want an opportunity to respond specifically? Yes, I would. Um, um, your microphone, please. Uh, if we save more money, which we can put more money away, we have to cut it from somewhere. So that would be services. The library is a service organization. We service our patrons. We don't want to cut things from our patrons. Our patrons tell us what they want. There are comment cards that come in constantly telling us what we want, what we need to do, what we're not doing well, what they, we can do to correct that. I mean, they're very explicit of, you need to do this, you need to do that. We, t we take that into consideration every month. We read all of those. So, yeah, you could have a bigger fund, but the amount of money we're saving with that addition, because we are able to bring in an automated book return, we're saving books are now coming out back onto the shelf in one day instead of four or five. Um, there are pictures, I think they're still on the library's website, of, of what it was like back a few years ago when there was a holiday, came back, and there was no book return. The books piled up in here, and it took days to sort them and get them back into the system. We're saving money on employees. So theoretically, it's not a quick return on their money, but, but we are getting money, money back on that. The friends are making more money on their book sales because the books are in a better order. They don't have to dig through boxes under tables in here. So I, I just disagree with the fact that we need to, again, we're getting less money in. We can't do the same things we did on the same money. Our employees, to keep quality employees, you got to give them a raise. Simple as that. Well, some of our employees make more than they did in 1950. I know you find that hard to believe, and our employees, I'm sure, don't believe that. But <laughs> So those are the things that we have no control over. We have to do it. We can drop wages, but we're going to lose quality employees. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bottom. Do we have another question from the audience? I'm going to go. And uh, maybe, Mr. Uh, Reyna, you will answer first on this one. Um, can you speak to some of your prior board experiences? Thank you very much. Um, first off, uh, although Mr. Bottom gave his, his resume at the beginning, I'll give mine right now. 
Um, I'm in the 30th year of being an attorney in good standing in the state of Michigan. I can practice all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. In terms of community organizations, I was a board member at Congregation Shir Tikva, where I was a longtime member. Um, I currently sit on one of the few paid boards in uh, Rochester Hills, the Historic Districts Commission, where, I've, where I was appointed in 2016 and reappointed in 2017, and I've been consistently a member of that board. Now, hopefully I've got a little bit of time so I can double back on an earlier issue. Mr. Bonham had mentioned that uh, when Headley came in, it had an impact on the, on the millage. When the millage was originally established by Avon Township in 1924, it was essentially up to one mill. But the history wasn't that one mill was consistently taken during that time. What happened was, at different points in the library's history, the library took less than what essentially the township had, had said that they could take. So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is that when Headley came in, Headley came in, it was voted in by Michigan voters in 1978. So if there's, a, there's an issue where people are saying, well, hey, we don't, we don't care what Grandpa, great grandpa did back during the Coolidge administration. Well, at least care what we did back in 1978, because for the past 40 years, we've been living with Hadley, we've been living with the same millage. And while I'm at it, the other thing that needs to be said about a millage is, a millage is one one thousandth. So that's a bit like me saying, I'm gonna give you a designated percentage of my income. So if I make $100, you get a designated percentage of $100. If I make $1,000, you get a designated percentage of $1,000. If I make $10,000, you get a designated percentage of $10,000. What's significant is, as my income rises and falls, sure, yours does, but so does mine. And as I'm taking income, a designated portion of my income and giving it to you, it's not like I've, <laughs> It's not like it's, it's a zero impact on me. I still have all the other obligations as a, as, a, as a citizen, a taxpayer, and a resident that I've got to service. I've got to pay city government. I've got to pay county government. I've got to pay state. I've got to pay uh, the federal government. And then I also have to maintain my own standard of living. My, my wife, my daughter, my household. People have a right to have the enjoyment of their, their resources. And if we've had a number, a designated percentage, a mill edge, that we've had in place for either 1924 to now or 1978 to now, that means that the library has had the consistent benefit of a common, reliable percentage of, of household income that they've been able to rely on. If it's gone up and down, well, that's what happens. I mean, sometimes there's good times, sometimes there's bad times. But I, I just want to make it clear that as we're talking about issues that the library faces financially, we're not talking in a vacuum. We're talking about issues that we all face financially. So as representatives, and this gets back to the friends of the library question, as representatives of the people of the city of Rochester Hills, our duty is to provide to the homeowners of Rochester Hills a quality library at a reliable tax rate that they can count on. And all I'm saying is, the tax rate that they've had, either since 1924 or since 1978, is a rate they should be able to count on. Thank you. Thank you. It's also a rate that when the uh, Headley came in, your wages didn't go down. Your wages still continue to go up. Our income went down 40% since 78. Now, very few people, and there's some guys on strike right now for UAW, because they don't want to go down any, they don't want to go down, they want to go up. And everybody else's wages and expenses has gone up, including the libraries. We have to pay higher salaries to keep good people. We have to pay higher things for our utilities and all their other expenses, the same as everybody else. But everybody else's didn't lose 40% of their income. This is a big number, folks. I mean, we have a $4 million budget. That's a million six a million six that we don't have anymore. Now we're trying to get, we're starting to get it back. But that is why all of these things have gone up and now even if we get it, they're gonna continue to go up. And to give the service and the resources that we need to serve our public and our patrons in the way they tell us they'd like to be served and what they'd like to have, we're gonna need more money because 
we can't, we can't continue with a 40%, and that number's not stable either. That number continues to go down. It could be, you know, we're, we're not just getting 60%, next year we're gonna 59 something. It continues to go down. Thank you. We'll start here and then. Um, yeah, I, this is for both candidates, so I'll let him choose who goes first. Mr. Bottom. Are we, am I on? Okay. Um, what do you think is the most important thing, given the fiscal constraints that you've both been talking about now for some time, what do you think is the most important thing that could be done now to improve the library service to the community? And remembering you only have one pie, so you've got to pay for it. Well, one of the most important things, of course, is getting materials and we have over the year, as, as the gentleman knows, since he comes to our board meetings, he, he is up to date with what we are doing. Um, we'll take money out of a certain area and move it to another area. We have the ability to do that, but stay in budget. And at the end of the year, sometimes there's a couple of dollars left over. Those are the dollars we either buy more materials with or we put it away for a rainy day. We're starting to rebuild our rainy day fund, but to take a bunch of services away to build it more, sure, we'd like it to be a million dollars again, and it will be a million dollars again somewhere along the way. But we don't want to sacrifice our uh, patrons' services to do that. But we do need, and that is one of the big concerns that we do have. Thank you very much for your question. Um, one of the consistent things that I do hear about the library um, in terms of its services and its offerings is a consistent level of satisfaction from the people who use the library. So it was very puzzling to me that there was a discussion about uh, maybe raising the millage in spring of 2019 because you had a situation where patrons by and large were saying they were satisfied with what they were getting. So I think we're getting to a point now where we're actually starting to tease out significant differences between the two candidates and where we stand on these issues. I'm 100% in support of Friends of the Library, their mission, their goal, and what they do in their history. I'm not a member of the Friends of the Library because I'm seeking to be an elected representative of the people to govern the resources that the people are able to devote in order to maintain this important resource. So if it would have been me doing it back in 2017, or strike that, four years ago, I would have taken a bit more time to consider whether I'm gonna take a million dollars in rainy day funds and devote them to the, to, 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 to the changing of the library. Sure, you can make a value judgment that a $400,000 book sorting machine is a wise investment. On the other hand, you can say, just like, you know, I was out, talk, I was out canvassing door to door, and the, 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 the voter that I was talking to had this huge lawn, and I was like, hey, how do you mow that lawn? And he's like, well, I, I give a hand mower, and I push it, and I go up one side, I go up down the other. And I said, well, how would you like to have a Rumba-type lawnmower? You know, it's a robot, and you say, Rumba lawnmower robot, go mow my lawn. He says, well, sure, I'd love to have something like that. And I'm sure they have the technology for something that could go and do that. But the thing is, that homeowner knew what people know. That if you spend money on an expensive addition, that you're gonna have to pay for it somewhere else. And the question that you're going to, assuming the customers are wrong, assuming patrons are wrong, and their satisfaction level of what they're getting from the library is wrong, and, and there are some issues where there are services where there's questions like Mr. Bonham's talking about. Assuming those, those things are all true, then, then that, takes us, that, that would take us off in a different direction. But significantly, you have to be responsible about the resources you have. You have to be responsible about what you can do with them. And I think the biggest service we could provide is to just track what I've seen, which is uh, patron satisfaction with the services that they've been getting, but doing it at existing uh, millage rates and existing payment rates for what they've, what they've been used to. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reno, you would 
answer first. Well, actually, I'm Christine Haig, and I'm the library director. I'm not asking a question. I want to correct a, a statement that was made. The library is funded through property taxes. This has nothing to do with income. It's based on home values, as all government institutions are. So the school district, the cities, the municipalities, we our income is a millage based on property values. And that's why the library lost so money, so much money with the recession, because home values went down. People lost some people lost their homes. Those home values are going up, but our income is based on property values, not income tax. Yeah, and that's that's what I had thought I had said if I didn't. Thank you for pointing that out. generally a lover of American public libraries, and uh, <clears throat> this one particularly, I'm a friend of the library and a volunteer, and right, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, my question is, I don't see the uh, contradiction between existing satisfaction with services and possibly raising the millage, because even if people are currently uh, satisfied with uh, services, which I'm sure we are. Um, <clears throat> we've touched briefly on the question of staff, but if we continue to have services and increase services, uh, we still need, as uh, Mr. Uh, Bonham said, we still have to have quality staff, they have to have decent salaries, and hopefully which will increase and not be frozen. I hope they have decent benefits, and they're not salary freezes anymore, I don't know. I read there were salary freezes. Uh, and eventually, I suppose, you will have to hire more people if we increase services and not have more and more services with fewer and fewer people doing the work. Volunteers only can do so much. You need qualified librarians and so on also. So I don't see that there's a contradiction there. I'll take it. I believe Mr. Bonham has already answered this. So Mr. Reyna, <laughs> what skills and experience do you bring to this position? First and foremost, uh, as I indicated, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 30 years. so. Being a lawyer uniquely requires one to uh, uh, deal with problem analysis, problem solving, to consider the strength of one argument versus another. Um, in terms of board experience, when I was at Congregation Chair Tikva, just like I would be doing as a library trustee, we would go over the annual budget, and by the way, we, uh, we succeeded always in producing balanced budgets as well, and making sure that that budget was within the resources of what our congregants are willing to offer. And significantly, the fact that I've been appointed and reappointed to one of the few paid commissions that the city of Rochester has testifies to the ability of me to make contacts with people, other people in city government. So each time that I was uh, appointed to the uh, uh, Historic Districts Commission, there was only one dissenting vote. So it was you know, all but one of the council members saying they wanted me on board up for that position. So I'm pleased to have those kind of contacts with city government and pleased to achieve that level of the ability to, to, show, that, uh, to, to show that there's a connection between uh, me and job performance and being able to stay in that position. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, we already um, talked a little bit about your background. Um, my question is, what in your background would lead us to believe you would serve the library and the community effectively as a board member? Mr. Bonham, maybe you can start. Well, of course, it's my 35 years on the board. Uh, I've gotten very familiar with how the library operates and uh, what the facilities need and most important, what the patrons need. Now, sure, we're providing those things today, but uh, we're not closing tomorrow, I hope. But uh, we're gonna need, to, if we give our employees a raise, that's gotta come out of somewhere. Well, where's it gonna come out? It can't come out of the, the electric bill or the uh, gas bill. It's gotta come out of the other services that we do. 
So we either have to cut programs. One of the things that's going on is, you know, a lot of our programs, they get filled up because we don't have the employees and we're not going to be able to get more employees on the same money. It's as simple as that. It's not real hard to figure out. I'm, I'm an accountant. I know how to do adding and subtracting. And uh, you're talking about adding expense when you've got to subtract that money from somewhere else to cover those employees. Now, we're not adding, asking for a millage for tomorrow. We're asking for a millage because it's going to take time to do these things. And as time goes on, 10 years from now, everybody's wages are going to be greater than they are today. I don't think I have a problem saying that because I think you'll all believe that. Well, okay, if the wages are much more than they are today, that's our largest expense here. By a long ways, our largest expense is employees. A lot of things would have to be cut to stay on the same budget we are now. So what my opponent is suggesting is, well, we'll cut those things. We'll cut those things. Well, that's not what the patrons are saying. They're saying they're happy with what we have. So to keep those things and to improve on those things, we're going to need some more money. However, this election isn't about only about more money. Okay, that, that item has passed. It's gone. What we're talking about here is who has the experience. I've come to every board meeting, every committee meeting for 35 years. I've gone to every one of them. I know what's going on in the library. I talk to the employees. I go out and say hello to them. How are you doing? How are your kids? What's going on here in this department? And I do that on a regular basis. I stop in and talk to Christine. I keep my hand on the pulse of this library. And that's why I think I'm a better candidate. Not surprisingly, I think I'm a better candidate. I think one of the most important things a prospective trustee can bring to the job is objectivity. Objectivity isn't saying, I'm going to look at everything the way the rot library wants to look at it. My son is going to rise and set based on whether it's going to be better for the library in terms of every little service that they want to add. My bottom line is as a representative of the, of the voters, property taxpayers for the city of Rochester Hills and for the surrounding communities that support this library to make sure that we're consistent with the millage rate that they've had since 1924. We've made, when, when, when Avon Township made a generational promise to this library, this library made an implied generational promise to the residents who support it, that it was going to live on a designated share of the, of the income that these people have, that these people have. So again, a millage, is different than saying, for, like for example, if you go to the, uh, the, the, the rules relating to who, how, how you get paid for jury service. If you go do jury service, you're going to get a check, the same kind of check that was, that was issued for the exact same number when they first set up the, 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 when they set up the statute and they last revised it. A millage says you're going to get a designated percentage share based on whatever your income is. So of course that number is going to go up and it's going to go down. If it goes up, then obviously the library's fortunes are going to improve. If it goes down, then the library and everybody else included is going to have to find ways to tighten their belt and make ends meet. Now, I've been listening very carefully to Mr. Bonham as he's been talking. Earlier during the course of this debate, he said, he said, well, you know, in 2008, we had a reversal, and we just finally got back up to the point where we're looking at budgets like we did back in 2008. And that's consistent with what the budgets show. But the point of what he's saying is that he's talking about an upward trajectory of property tax income that's been raising. And this is when we're going to be talking about having a, a, a millage. And while we're at it, there's two other things that need to be mentioned. We're going to be talking about having a property tax increase or a millage increase at a point where uh, four years ago, there was over a million dollars in a rainy day fund at least some of which that could have been saved to help defray some of these potential problems. And another thing is, we're going to have it maybe in the spring of 2020 when library board members wouldn't be up for re-election. I submit to you that the library is an important enough item that we shouldn't play politics with it. If the library's position in the spring of 2019 was that they really thought a village should have taken place and they thought what the, the financial case justified, 
They should have just stuck with that decision. They should have said, hey, let's put it on the ballot. Let's go out there. Let's be candid with the voters. Let's have our, our trustees run on that issue, and let's give voters in the fall election a chance to say yay or nay to the candidates and their arguments about why. The fact that that wasn't done and the fact that the issue was only tabled so that it could be brought back when maybe somebody wasn't up for election is not playing square with voters, and that's not, that's not fair. So in terms of your question, what can I bring? If you're, if you're a resident of Rochester Hills, I can bring my promise that I'm going to remember how hard you work for every dollar you pay. I can bring my promise that I'm going to remember you when I'm sitting on that board and I'm making votes about how much we're going to look to you for resources and help. But as a person who's with the library, I'm going to be doing everything I can, and this is part of my three-pronged pl platform, to reach out to other groups and other communities so that we can try to enhance the partnerships we have to work with them help them grow their reputation footprint through library sponsorships to try to help to try to help move things forward. Thank, Thank you, you. Mr. Reagan. Okay, my question is you um, the library board had a focus group several of them my question is, were either one of you attending any of the focus groups? Were you asked to be on the focus group? Mr. Reina, if you can start. Yeah, basically what happened is the, and I, I think the number was 30,000. The library paid essentially, it, they, they get these consultants. So when the consultant has a focus group, what they do is they just recruit people on their own. So it's not like, it's not like, it's a bit like um, when they run, uh, a group to, to, to volunteer to watch a movie. So it's, it's like that type of a thing. So you were not in a focus group? Right, because okay. the way they do the focus groups is the, the consultant actually brings these people in. They, right. uh, they, they do it that way. Just a quick yes or no is all I need. Well, I can't just do a quick yes or no. <laughs> to have library board members in the focus group changes the focus. So it's not a good idea to have board members in the focus group. We want to find out what the other people think. We don't want to taint it by what we think. Okay, I was. I was asked to be in a focus group and I was very pleased to be asked. There was a board member in the focus group that I was at. I was surprised that A, that person was asked to be in it, B, that person was an active member in it, did not recuse themselves. I wouldn't have minded if they had just sat there to listen. I've been puzzled ever since the day I went to my focus group, haven't quite made up my mind whether I thought that which should have been allowed should have happened. That's why I asked the question. Thank you. I'm a member of the Friends of the Library uh, Board. And Mr. Bonham, this question's for you. If you would please clarify why the millage was tabled. F um, my information was that part of it was that um, the school board and the OPC were also going for millages at the same time. And we just, the library thought to pull out. And OCC is going also. Okay. OCC is going also, so there, that would be the fourth millage request on this election. Um, it's just not good common sense to become f the fourth. Uh, there was a lot of discussion at a lot of board meetings um, that are open to the public for anybody to come to, and uh, people that would have come to it would have known exactly what happened and why we discussed it. Um, but there are some people that weren't at that meeting or any of those meetings, as a matter of fact. So they didn't know what the discussion was. And it wasn't an easy, quick discussion. It was seven months of discussions. And every time we looked at things, something changed. Every single time. We had discussions, and we didn't only discuss with our board. We have members from Oakland Township there and members from the city of Rochester. 
that come in and give us their opinions and stuff. And all of that was taken into consideration. And again, over all of these meetings. So if you would come to the meetings, you would have known exactly why that was done. Brief response? Yeah, very briefly. <clears throat> to my eye, spring 2019, board said it wants a millage increase. May 2019, I'm running against the millage as an anti-millage candidate. June 12, 2019, board changes its position. People are going to give you an answer when they say why they did something. A record can be created to support whatever that position is. However, I think voters are entitled to consider that history in terms of determining why the board really made its decision to pull the millage from the November 2019 fall ballot. I have a question respectively for each of you. Um, Steve, you mentioned you had a three-prong attack. My first question is what were your other um, campaign promises, but you answered that rather nicely. And it was fiscal responsibility um, without the existing, with the existing millage, um, in-house computer par partnership with Rochester Hills new businesses, personal policy to assure annual review of director. Can you elaborate, pick any one of those and elaborate on what specifics, if you have any, at this point? And then I have a question specifically for Mr. Bodner after that. Um, I'm going to focus on the library partnerships because obviously we've kind of um, pretty thoroughly covered some of the financial issues that are uh, on the table. When John F. Kennedy first said, hey, I'm going to have a Peace Corps, Interestingly enough, many people don't know this, but he said it at, first said it outside of the student union at the University of Michigan. When he said it, he, it was just something he said. So it was an idea. It was, it was the nucleus of a germ of an idea. And in much the same way, my idea of library partnerships is the nucleus of the germ of an idea. It is true that we have many groups that are out there and committed to supporting our library. Our, our, our army of volunteers, the countless hours they put into the library, the, the self-sacrificing way that they keep the, the operation going really deserves our respect. They are heroes, and I have the greatest respect for them. I think our friends are also heroes of the library because they too have not only come in with words, but they've come in with resources. For example, during uh, the million dollars that was put into the restoration of the building, they were instrumental in terms of helping secure additional resources to help bring the rest of that project together. And they deserve credit for that as well. But just because we have some existing resources doesn't mean that, that's, that we've reached the bottom of the bucket. As I've indicated, our Chamber of Commerce holds regular ribbon cuttings around the Rochester, Rochester Hills community area where new businesses come in. And each of these new businesses is a new opportunity to solicit a partnership with somebody in the community and to give them an opportunity to help grow their reputation footprint. Now in terms of, uh, in terms of how fully formed my idea is at this point, you know, I, I'm not saying that I'm on the steps of the, you know, Student Union at U, at U of M, like, that, that, that reference is back. Well, well here, you may recall that I started my comment by talking about uh, President Kennedy and how he announced the creation of the Peace Corps at the student, outside the Student Union at U of M. But, but, but just, but, and that's what I call the nucleus of a germ of an idea. So in, in that way, I, I don't know that I'm that far back in the process, but I am early enough in the process that it is something that could be added to, it is something that could flower, and it is something that in addition to the other sources of uh, community partnership and the other friends that we have, are, along with our volunteers, that could be a potential, excuse me, <coughs> a potential untapped resource. And just because that's the one that I've cited doesn't mean that that would be the end of it. But I think it's important for us to be creative in recognizing that as popular as our library is, it's an opportunity to have other people other groups, other businesses come in, join us, help sponsor, and help us grow, and in a way, help them grow too. Thank you. I don't know if this is permissible, but I do want to point out that a few years ago, and Christine, you can correct me on this, that the library took initiative to go to Oakland University 
and to Rochester College and set up booths and we had circulation staff, we had li librarians, administrations, and they, they actively encouraged students and pretty well anyone there as employees and, and students to get library cards and it was a tremendously successful endeavor which as far as I know continues on. So I, I, you know, there are business partnerships that we can identify. Okay, I gotta flip to my other page here for the next question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bodner, there are many challenges. Uh, no, your question is, what would you consider the most important project you were involved with or contributed to the library in your time here, and what was the benefit? Well, it's hard to nail down one project. Some of the projects in 35 years, um, three directors, um, getting a new director for the library is a major project. You don't just pull somebody off the street and we do a lot of research on those, and, uh, and we currently have a great one. We've had good ones before, too. But um, selling the old building and building a new building was a major, major undertaking. When we undertook that project, we originally didn't have this piece of property. We uh, looked around for a piece of property, and we found one up on North Rochester Road. And at that time, the city of Rochester found out that we have 2,500 patrons a day, a day, in downtown Rochester. They did not want to lose that number of people coming to downtown Rochester. So they negotiated to buy this piece of property and then negotiated with us to give it to us. Not to sell it to us, but to give it to us. And now we have a valuable library and a valuable resource right here in downtown Rochester. The center of Rochester Hills, as everybody knows that lives out here, is Rochester. People, we talk to people and we tell them I live in Rochester Hills, and they turn around and say, well, how are things in Rochester? They don't recognize Rochester Hills as being there. We're not the only time, city that has that problem. Farmington and Farmington Hills have the same problem. But to negotiate those things when building this building, and then to find ways to get through these years uh, without cutting services. We did cut some services. We had to cut some services on Sundays and so forth just to get by. But at a certain point, and I've got to admit that because we've been able to do it all, maybe that's hurting us. We don't want our patrons to suffer that we have to use, miss something and they can't do something because we're short a few dollars. So we work very hard to get the budget and try to keep what we have. However, what's happening now in today's world is it's getting harder and harder. We have to start losing things. We don't want to lose things. We want to continue, and we, we're not exactly sure what's going to come up in the future. We don't know. We're, we're looking at it. We're keeping a, a, um, a pulse on it, but some of these things come up and it's just, we have to spend money to save money. And we put all new electric lights in the building a few years ago because they were very much cost efficient. Well, we didn't ask for a millage to do that. Uh, we didn't ask for a millage, again, to do the improvements that we've done. And the patrons are improving and in, in, uh, rena, rena, uh, reaping the benefits from the things we have done. So to say there's one project that's been I guess I'd have to put the new building on the top, um, but directors and budget are ongoing things, and, and those are very important to me to make sure we do the right job on those. Um, this is a question for Mr. Vena. Hold on. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, this is a question from Mr. Reyna. And uh, although I'm interested to know exactly when you started attending board meetings and how many you've attended, my major question is related to your, one of your prongs of your attack, which I understand to be commercial sponsorship of like Comerica Park type sponsorship of the library. Um, I'm one of the people who could not afford to continue being a librarian. And so I worked in libraries for roughly 15 years and then spent 50, 30 years working for a, in the computer field. Um, so I'm really curious to know 
how you envision this for-profit commercial sponsorship, as I'm interpreting it, of library services, facilities, et cetera, um, lines up with the core mission of the library to be, um, you know, the nonprofit of nonprofits and the upholder of intellectual freedom and nonpartisanship and so forth possible. How does, I mean, if Ascension Hospital comes in here and says, well, here for you if there's no books on whatever we don't agree with in the Catholic Church, how's that going to work? I'm just curious to hear your, your nucleus of the germ of an idea on that. Thank you. Well, first off, I'm sorry that uh, you weren't able to continue in your chosen profession. Um, for my part, uh, I didn't get to be a football player. So, so. Uh, <laughs> All right. The point is that their life, life deal reversals, and I'm sorry that you had that one to deal with. I apologize for you, and I'm sorry that that's that that's part of your history. Um, I can only hope that the the new career you've chosen, and as you're moving on to it, is something that's pleasing to you, and that you're you're finding some joy in that. In relationship to your specific question. Um, there's nothing inconsistent with the idea of, uh, uh, you know, endowments. Endowments um, from companies, sponsorships from companies, are commonly used in any number of any other settings. And the, if 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 a, if a donation is going to be made, then the don the donee, the person who's going to be in a position of receiving it, is going to be able to say, hey, listen, I'm not going to I'm not going to take it with any strings attached, so to speak. So they'll be able to decline something that is inconsistent with their mission goals and objectives. But the idea of sponsorships, that's something that's consistent, routine, and commonly used. And it's, 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 it's been used in other settings. So I don't see any reason why it couldn't, it couldn't take place here. Um, I think that answers that part of the question. Um, if there's anything more that you, you want to get in terms of a response, please let me know. If you can hang on one second, if you've got a follow up, I'll bring the mic. I'm not aware, I haven't heard, okay, I haven't heard from you anything that speaks to me in my understanding and perception why you feel driven to be a member of the board of this library, why libraries are important to you why this library is important to you other than I don't want to pay more taxes. I, I don't have children, I'm happy to pay school taxes. Part of why property values in this town are high is because of the quality of the schools and the quality of the library. I don't mind paying taxes. I'm curious why you want to be part of the library board and what I mostly hear from you in print and tonight is we should do it on a nickel. Thank you. Okay, first off, I'm gonna, before you take the, the, it away from her, there was some talking in, in, the, in, a, in, the, in another part of the audience when she was first sharing what she was sharing with me. So you were, you're, the beginning of your question had to do with uh, wanting to get a sense of my, the passion, what brings me to the position of library trustee, that type of thing. Okay, great. <clears throat> well, libraries are a subset of universities. Clark Kerr, um, who's done many studies on universities and libraries, has said a very important observation. He said that out of the 100 oldest organizations on the planet, 85 of them are some type of library or university. So our library isn't just a jewel of our community. Our li libraries generally are a jewel of, Amer of, of human civilization, period. Uh, some of the hallmarks of the idea that a community was a community is that we find a library there. So in terms of the history of it, I'm completely on board with the idea of the importance and significance of libraries. I'm personally a huge book collector, so I have a huge library at my own home. I have a huge library at my office. So I've got an intimate fascination with the idea that you can have this collection of, of, of books that mark out a range of knowledge that you can just capture in one place. 
If you want to time travel, go to a book. If you want to go forward in time, go to a book. If you want to go on any wildest adventure, go to a book. If, if you want to go to any place or understand anything, you can find it through the pages of a book. Now, in terms of my connection to this library, I mean, there's an, a lot of these things arise by accidents of history. So, you know, I wasn't a lifelong resident of Rochester Hills. I came to live here about 13 years ago. When I did, I, I, I quickly found the library and, and quickly became a big fan and started taking books out and started reading them. And as time went on, I became more and more interested, not only in the library, this great collection of books and the resources that this library has, but I also became in, interested in the library governing structure as well. I had an opportunity to run for library board back in 2017, which is when I first started attending library board meetings. So at that point, um, there, was a, there, was a, there was a library trustee who had dropped, essentially indicated she was gonna drop out of the race. So at that point, I was gonna go in and then it would just be essentially just two candidates running and I was gonna run at that point and, and get out at that point. And when it turned out that she, wasn't, that she had decided after all she was gonna run again, I decided, well, I'll, I'll hold off this election. And you're right, the financial component did help persuade me that yes, this was a year to get in, but not because I wanna run the library on a nickel, but because I wanna have respect for the financial needs of our, our taxpayers and to make sure that we deliver a quality service to them at a rate that they've generationally been able to rely on. I don't think that's about delivering a service on a nickel. I don't think that's about trying to shortchange anybody. I don't think that's about bad faith. I think respecting the financial wherewithal and needs of our of our citizens is the hallmark of a is, 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 a, is a hallmark of a uh, of a good library trustee. Thank you, Mr. Rainer. Mr. Bond, you can take it first. Hi, I actually have two questions, but I'll ask one now, and if we have time, I'll circle back around to the other. But I just wonder, um, probably even though Mr. Bonham's instructed to start this question, it might be more for Mr. Reyna. How many Rochester Hills Public Library board meetings have you each attended? Well, as I stated earlier, as I stated earlier all of them. Over the 35 years, I, I, I haven't get them all. I've missed one every almost every year. I miss one, uh, but I've also been to all of the committee meetings, and again, a lot of the stuff that's been talked about was discussed at these board meetings. So I've been to all of them. I was to a handful of meetings back in 2017, and since then, I've followed the uh, library through the media. Now, please remember, I'm seeking my first term on the library board, so I have not been an elected member of the uh, library board or I haven't actually sat as a as a trustee I mean I'm, I've, I've been essentially like anybody else would be a resident of the community who has an interest in a civic organization so as a resident have you attended any of the Rochester Hills Public Library board meetings oh, yes uh, a handful in 2017 a handful yeah, yeah, yeah mr. bottom did you have a, another comment Please bring your uh, mic. The minutes don't show that. I object to that statement because the because I, I, if you go online, you can actually see that I'm listed in the minutes. So, thank you. Hi, this is for Mr. Rainia. I'm a new resident in the state of Michigan, and this is an experience since in New Jersey, where I come from. Uh, board members are just appointed by the mayor. But my question for you is, uh, and I understand that it's a, a new idea about alternate sources of funding, but I'm curious, would you create a new staff position? Because once we look out for alternate sources of funding, they have to be sustained. And in my previous career, it was grants, and grants are not just something you write. They need to be sustained. So how would you do this? Would this be the library director's responsibility? Would it be board responsibility? And how would you depend on it year after year? Okay, 
first off, welcome to our community. Thank you. Um, in Michigan, some library boards are appointed uh, by their local city council or township board. As a matter of fact, there's three groups that contribute to representation on this library board. The, the city of Rochester Hills has an elected component. The two other communities that uh, send, they, they send representatives that are appointed by their respective governing boards. So the system that you're familiar with from out of state is the system that, that partly exists here and it actually does exist in other places in the state of Michigan. Um, now getting to the rest of your question, um, I'm, I wasn't thinking of something so lofty as, as, a, as, as a grant writing type of situation. It, the, again, the Chamber of Commerce has regular ribbon cuttings that are held a handful of times a month. Uh, it could, what, what happens is when, you, when they have these ribbon cuttings, the city of Rochester Hills will actually send a member of their city council. The person will show up and help express goodwill toward the new business owner. And I certainly, as a new member of the Board of Trustees, would be happy to go on as an elected representative and go and, uh, and attend and, and show support for these, these new opening businesses. I think this would be a good opportunity for other uh, library trustees as well to get out and, and make connections in the community. Now, in terms of sponsorships, again, it wouldn't be something as lofty as grant writing, which, as you, do, as you rightfully point out, really would require... Uh, very uh, concentrated support. I mean, this could be something as simple as if they're going to do it, they could just they could just give. So I mean, so I mean that that would kind of reduce the majesty of the amount of work that would actually be necessary. So so I mean, but but in, in all respects, you're pointing out some important issues, and I, I really appreciate the question and you sharing that with us. Thank you, Mr. Bottom. Response. I do want to bring up that we do go out to new businesses in all three communities. We go out and offer their employees library cards and tell them they're welcome to use our library because they are employees here. So we do reach out to every new business that comes in and uh, allow them to use our facilities. Just brief follow up. Go ahead. Okay. Um, as I've been attending these ribbon cuttings, I, I haven't seen any elected members from the, the board there. Perhaps I haven't, I've, I've missed the, the right ones to go to. I don't know. but. I think every extra effort that can be put out there in order to make sure that the library in all ways is being part of the ribbon cutting experience, all the other parts of the experience, and making sure that we're, we're saying, we're here with you, you can be here with us. Boy, I think that's an excellent message, and that's one I'd be interested in putting my time and energy into. Thank you. We have time for just a couple more questions. It's me again. Let's stop with the here and now. Let's think for because one of the roles of library board directors is to address the, the current problems. But let's think forward now. Let's think about this library and libraries in general in not 2020 coming up, 2040, 2050. What do you see as the role of libraries in the United States? And what do you see as the role of this library in Rochester Hills, also serving under contract the city of Rochester and Oakland Township, where I live? Mr. Bottom, if you could start. Well, needless to say, if we're going out that far, the, the library is going to change considerably. We all grew up with libraries where you uh, went in and you got shushed by the employees, quiet, quiet. Today's libraries are not that way. They didn't have computers. They didn't have uh, record albums. They didn't have a lot of stuff that have, we have now. And that is going to continue to happen. 20 years from now, uh, I don't believe any of us can predict. But the only way to keep on top of that is to keep in touch with the American Library Association, with our two cities that we work with. Some of those folks are getting information and saying, hey, this library did this. I went on vacation, and this library did that. One of the things that happened here is uh, when we brought in the uh, uh, self-checkout. Uh, I happened to have gone to a library in another state, and 70%, 80% of their stuff was self-checkout. So I said, how do they get self-checkout to so many people? Well, what they did is hid the desk. <laughs> if, you hide, if you hide the desk, and all that's out there is the self-checkout. Guess what happens? So these are the things that we do, uh, not only from the board, from the employees, 
from the patrons and from the other boards and stuff that we do. I mean, Oakland Township is an elected board as we are. Rochester Hills, uh, uh, Rochester appoints a person. So there are a lot of people involved in gathering information and bringing it into this library so that we have an idea of what's going on. And a lot of that is forward thinking, stuff that somebody else somewhere has thought about and then we've looked at it. Uh, one of those things that happened was automated book return. Uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago, nobody had it. So we started looking at it and it took some time to get the right ones. So this is the type of things that we do as a board and as a library. Well, I mean, this is very much like the earlier question because it, it again, calls for the idea of a recognition of things that we, there, there's, there's this information in, in problem solving, there are, informa there's, there's informa there are problems for which we have the information that we need to answer the problem right now. And then there's other problems where the information that we're gonna need to solve the problem is something that's gonna emerge, but it's not gonna emerge at a uniform rate. There's gonna be some information that we're gonna get in the near future, there's gonna be some information that we're gonna get in the indeterminate future, and then there's some information we're gonna get in the long-term future. As with any other business, as with any other governmental unit, I think the strength and ability for us to be ready for changes as they come forward is gonna to be to make sure that we have the sound fiscal responsibility, sound, fiscal respons sound fiscally responsible management to make sure that we're living within our means and that as these opportunities come up, we have the resources and finances to exploit them. So I think that uh, having a healthy pocketbook is gonna be key to be being ready for the future. We have time for one more question. This is directed toward both of you. Hoping that you're an active library user, I guess I would first start with that. Are you an active library user? And assuming the answer is yes, how? Like what materials do you check out? Um, I guess what are your favorites here at the library? Do you attend programs? That sort of thing. Mr. Reina, if you could start. Well, I'm an avid reader. Um, I read something on the average of one to two books a year. My, my high for the past five years was 124 books. Um, I've got a really cute story because one of my favorite sections is the science section. And I picked up a book called Venus Revealed and it turned out it was by a guy named Professor David Grinspoon, who it turns out is one of the big honchos in the astrophysics movement. After reading his book, I became such a fan of Mr. Grinspoon's that I actually reached out to him and he and I are now friends on Facebook. Um, there's another book I, I, I got through the library here by Professor Cockle, and uh, he's out of Oxford University in, uh, in Great Britain. Um, he became a Facebook friend of mine. Um, I, I find the science stuff very fascinating, but in general I find the books just, like, I, like I, everything I said about why I have a library and the way I feel about libraries is, is just true. It's just, it's, it's just an irreplaceable way to, to make contact with history, to make contact with new events, to make contact with other peoples and other ways of looking at things. And I, 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 I've, I've loved every single book I've gotten here. But I did want to give you those specific examples because you know, they, uh, I, there's some attachment to that, that I have to them. Thank you. I uh, use the library a lot. Um, mysteries and adventure books. Um, and I, I don't use tapes, I don't use uh, videos, but uh, I do come into the library and I use the library as a resource. I'm not afraid to call the information desk, I'm not afraid to call Christine, I'm not afraid to call anybody in this library and ask for information. And that is one of the biggest things that we provide. Not only information in books, but there's information that we decide to provide through the internet, uh, just things that are somewhere and nobody knows where, you call uh, the uh, adult services desk and tell them, I want to know about this recipe that I ate in China. Somebody will come up with that answer for you. So the, the resources here that I use, again, are the information that I get and then the books for pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, 
we're now going to begin our closing statements, which uh, please hold them to approximately 30 seconds, so a, a good wrap-up of, of your statements from this evening. And we'll do them in reverse order that we did the opening statements. So, Mr. Bond, you're first. I believe that the Rochester Hills Public Library is an asset to our community. It provides services to Rochester Hills, Rochester, and Oakland Township. I believe we need to invest in the future of the library and know the library will continue to benefit its patrons, our cities and our townships for the changing needs of that, that community. I will work hard to see that this is accomplished in the most responsible way. Thank you, Mr. Reyna. I, Attorney Steve Reyna, am seeking a first term as the only candidate who's kept a campaign promise before getting elected, which I say because until I declared my candidacy and also my opposition to the recently proposed millage, the library board wanted to raise your taxes, a position they reversed when they feared running in an election where they'd have to defend their views against an anti-millage candidate, all of which is to get explained together with my entire program and endorsements on Steve Reyna, my campaign page on Facebook. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And this is a reminder to both the audience as well as those watching on home. Uh, this seat that is your, you would be voting for is for two of three candidates. So two of three candidates that were present, two were present this evening along with a third candidate that we introduced at the beginning. And that is for two six-year terms. There's also another seat open for the library. Um, uh, Suba Sabero is running for a two-year term unopposed. The election is on November 5th. Please vote. Um, this concludes our forum, and the League of Women Voters appreciates all the candidates, your time, your information this evening, as well as the audience for the very informed questions you asked. Um, well, we would like to thank Rochester Hills Public Library for providing the venue and for televising the program this evening. The forum will be rebroadcast re several times before the election on WOW Channel 10, Comcast Channel 20, and AT&T Channel 99. It will also be available on YouTube on, and on the libraries and cities website at rhpl.org and rochesterhills.org. Um, thank you again for this evening. The League will also host a forum for upcoming Rochester Hills City Council election. That forum will be Wednesday evening, September 25th at 7 p.m. at the auditorium in Rochester, City Hall, Rochester Hills City Hall. It will be also telecast live on the city's TV channels and all residents are welcome to attend and to bring questions. Um, the League has also prepared a voter guide for all of the candidates and office seekers for this election and it will be available on their website lwvoa.com, org, thank you, L, I'm going to do it again, lwvoa.org, and that'll be a bit available near the end of September. We hope that this candidate's forum has been informative and will assist you in casting your for informed vote on November 5th. Please remember to vote, and thank you. Have a good evening.